Thank you, Nicola. Uh, we will now give the floor to Chris de Newberg. Um, Chris is currently Chief of Child Poverty and Social and Economic Policy Responses at the UNICEF Innocenti Research Center in Florence. He's a uh, formerly academic director of the Maastricht School of Governance. Uh, he's a specialist on empirical analysis of social protection systems, fo focusing particularly on the efficiency and effectiveness of social policies. His research and publications include labor economics, public finance, and social economics. Furthermore, Chris has a long track record of teaching both master and PhD students and regularly contributes to training modules at the World Bank Institute and the Asian Development Bank Institute. Uh, Chris will be drawing from his experience at the Innocenti, at Innocenti and the Maastricht Graduate School of Governance to reflect on the topics today. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, so what I would like to do is use this uh, next 10 minutes to give you an idea of how um, the Innocenti, the UNICEF Innocenti Research Center in Florence um, deals with the problems that Nicola just uh, put on the table in a clear way and that the book describes, uh, describes very well. As Nicola uh, has indicated, UNICEF has some tradition in dealing with uh, some of the problems, although not with all of the problems, and we're trying to make progress in order to indeed, as you may expect from a UNICEF center, put uh, the children's issues uh, at the center of the table and especially at the center of the policy table. So, um, here I can go. Um, first of all, um, the Innocenti Center has quite a reputation uh, in what is called the Rapid Card Series, which is mainly child poverty, and it's child poverty and deprivation, in fact, in rich countries, and trying to analyze that. I begin with that because it gives a good example of how we try to mainstream not just the material well-being of children, but all the other dimensions that Nicola uh, was pointing to. And I give you the example of the last report card and the next two report cards. Mm -hmm. The last report card, which was published in November 2011, uh, sorry, 2010, um, the name, uh, it was named Children Left Behind, and what it tried to do is to estimate in five different dimensions for rich countries how far the bottom part of the children, the bottom part of the distributions, are away from the median part in each of these countries and rank the countries in these five dimensions um, accordingly and see, okay, which countries we are doing better in closing the gap between, say, the average child in the country compared to the children that are really at the bottom of the distribution in each of these five dimensions, which is a way to make visible uh, in each of these dimensions other types of deprivations for children um, compared to just mat material well-being. So in fact, it's not only about ch child poverty, it's about uh, child deprivation. In the report card we're currently working at, uh, which is report card 10, which will be published at, in November of this year, at least if the EU has the willingness to publish the data that we are waiting for. Uh, we are especially going to look at overlapping dimensions of deprivations, uh, which means that we are especially interested in children in rich countries that are deprived in many areas at the same time. So not only live, for example, in, this, in a poor family, but also uh, do not go effectively to school or are left out of school, dropped out of school, or do not have access to health services, or do have other deprivations in terms of access to uh, space to play, access to libraries or to books to study, and things, uh, things like that. Again, we try to measure as much as the data allow us uh, and try to put all these dimensions um, into uh, into one single, uh, not a single indicator, but at least in trying to see where these children are. It's, we will do this for, uh, and I'm thinking, 32, 35 countries, so not only for the EU countries, but on top of that for all the countries within Europe and um, that adopted the EU SILIC data, but also for the USA, Australia, and Canada. We would have liked we have Japan and New Zealand on board as well. Unfortunately, we do not have access to their data. And the national governments are not willing to give access to the data. So that's because of privacy legislation. So but that's um, so you see, that's another way of looking at these multidimensional, multi-layered um, deprivation and poverty issues among children. The next report card, 
that one of 2012, which on, on which we are working uh, there as well, already as well. We remake the report card seven because we will have an update of all the data that are used, which are especially on health and education, and trying to again come up with an index of child well-being that was used already in 2000, in 2000, in the sorry, in the report card seven, and has been uh, had a lot of influence on the policy making in the rich in the rich countries, especially in this particular country, in the UK. Um, but not only in the UK. These report cards do the analyze, so they, they try to go as far as possible in uh, mainstreaming the information, but still in a quantitative way. So what we do is having a broader look and then still try to capture it in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a quantitative way, mainly because that's the way governments react to, or that's the, the issue, if you bring it to the table in this way, to governments, they will react to, uh, to it more easily. It tries to influence the child-related policies in these rich countries, and putting children in the center, and it, f it tries to frame the analysis, or the results of the analysis, in a language that, polic that policymakers respond to, especially in a language that journalists respond to, because it's by having these things into the open debate that policymakers uh, will react. To give you an, an example, I mean, the, the example of the, uh, of the reaction to Report Card 7 in the UK has been massive and, and important for the government taking action and saying, look, it's unacceptable for the UK to be in the last place if they make up a child well-being index, so we will work on that. On the Report Card, which is published in November, for example, the Belgian government spent two hours in the parliament discussing the issue only discussing, discussing the issue that Belgium was the last placed in the last place in one of the indicators, which was an education and educational uh, differences between the median and, and the bottom uh, children. And Finland, who was ranked first, if you think it's only for countries that do badly, that's not true, because the Finnish government, uh, before the elections, I must say, uh, took the decision to have a serious debate on, okay, Finland seems to do well, but there are all kind of forces playing that will get us in a better or in worse shape in a couple of years from now. So the report card in itself, so this, this quantitative information, has been like the leverage for the political parties that uh, currently still at power in, 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 in Finland to say, okay, we have to put this, this on the agenda because we're looking good now, but it's not going to, to stay that way. Um, then going, yes, thank you. Uh, then going to the, con to, the, to the research that we're doing in, um, in middle and low income countries uh, is uh, partially repeating what we do for, for rich countries. There has been started uh, since 2007, I thought, a global poverty study which in, uh, encompasses 70 countries uh, in the middle and low income country group in order to try to understand, um, again, poverty very much in a material well-being idea, but also in other dimensions. Um, we are going now to the second phase of the Global Poverty Study, and we at Innocenti Research Center, the Global Poverty Study was made out of New York, not out of Innocenti Center. We will take the second part uh, uh, on board and looking there again in the overlapping dimensions of the child poverty. So the repeating more or less what we, as far as the data allow us to do, to do what we did for the rich countries or what we're currently doing for the rich countries and using basically mixed data but also other data and again looking at those children that are deprived in most most of the di dimensions. Another instrument, another uh, major research project that we have at research at Innocenti Research Center is the understanding of or trying to understand which instruments do work well and despite the fact that um, not only UNICEF, but the World Bank and many other uh, international organizations, and quite a lot of donors, including DFID uh, and others, have invested a lot in social protection uh, organizations and, and organization in, in the middle and low income countries. There's very little known on what does that do for the children. Did that change? The, the life of the children and under what conditions did certain uh, uh, social protection interventions led to an improvement of the lives of children and under what conditions may have the same social protection in intervention did not lead to an improvement of the lives of children. 
which I think is an important uh, thing to know, and we are doing research on that. If we say doing research on that, it also means that results will not be available tomorrow. Uh, we're currently in the research process. In some cases, it will be available by the end of the year. In another cases, it will be available somewhat later in 2012. Thank you. Um, we try also to look at um, trying to understand better, because we believe uh, that um, the problem, as outlined by, by Nicola and Andy in, in the book, is a very serious problem. But there is another way uh, also to mean mainstream it. It's not to say that uh, what they propose in the book uh, is, not, is, 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 not, uh, is not good. No, definitely it should be done, and it should be done the way they, they propose it. There is also another way, which is a more um, research-driven uh, way of, of um, trying to incorporate mainstream, mainstream the, um, the, the basic um, evidence, is, is trying to understand how new theoretical frameworks may lead to mainstreaming these non-material aspects of, of uh, child well-being. For example, we try to understand what really happens between if a child is malnourished, what does that do for the working memory of a child, and what does that do for its learning opportunities. We try, these are all ongoing research projects. Social norms and child protections. We try to understand how changes in social norms in societies have contributed or just, on the other hand, prevented children of being abused or being the victims of violence. And we uh, also invest in new theoretical ways of, of thinking by, um, so we already, already said that we're not only looking at poverty and material well-being, we try to develop also the theories on, on the multidimensional uh, deprivation, overlapping deprivations. Our next step is to go beyond that and introduce a new, uh, at least a new way, of what we think is a new way of uh, introducing it and looking at resilience of children against uh, shocks and, uh, and so on. That will be a paper that will be available in August. We're currently theoretically working on that. And that's all to say, and that's the last thing uh, I will say, is that it goes um, on equity and beyond, in the sense that equity is trying to understand where exactly in the society are the children that, le children that are left behind, uh, most obviously, and what could be done about that. I think there's another slide, but I will leave that for the next time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, we will now turn to the presentation of Valerie Brown.